आज़बिल्लाशैतान रजीम बसमीम इन शाला ड्यूरिंग द डे यूल बी लिसनिंग टू अ रेंज ऑफ स्कॉलरली आर्टिकल्स एंड पेपर्स दैट आर गोइंग टू बी एड्रेस टू यू वट आई हैव हेयर इज़ नॉट मे बी वेरी स्कॉलरली बट इट्स जस्ट बाई वे ऑफ शेयरिंग सम थाट्स एंड आइडियाज़ ऑन द टॉपिक दैट डॉक्टर हमाद साहब हैज़ जस्ट मैंशनड एंड द इशू दैट आई एम हेयर टू टॉक अबाउट हैज़ ऑलवेज बीन ए कंसर्न फॉर मी but i remember when it actually turned from only a concern to a serious concern in a meeting with a renowned academic in the setting of a leading research oriented university about my plans of writing a dissertation on the role of the amdia muslim community in the establishment of pakistan i was told that i would have to decide who i want to please if the community is happy the academics might not be and vice versa it was around those days back in 2011 that i came across a research where the author had attempted to prove that the east london mosque was london's first mosque and not masjid fazil i struggled to finish reading the article as i was embraced by the urge to start writing a response but as you would all know to write well one has to read very well as i embarked upon the task of writing a response to the article i had to decide what approach i was going to take among other decisions i made for myself the one that topped the list was the decision to stick primarily to external sources and that too primary ones i had to closely observe what approach the author in question had taken in bringing up the debate instead of pushing his idea and persuading his readers to believe in the point he was trying to make he gave the evidence he had been able to gather and left it for the reader to decide i decided that i was going to take a similar approach i had to take a step back and ask myself that although i'm fully convinced that the fazil mosque is london's first mosque but do i have re- enough reason and enough evidence to believe so or is it just my love for and the affiliation with the mosque that makes me think so the answer i got was that i did not have sufficient evidence for my understanding the more i read about the history of mosques in london the curious i got because there had been funds set up for a london mosque by non amdi muslims in london long before the fazil mosque was built amongst the trustees were influential um personalities muslim personalities like sayyid amir ali they had been renting houses to offer juma prayers in congregation in various parts of london which were now being taken as a prefix of what later materialized as the east london mosque so they had a case but i had commissioned myself to prove that a mosque is meant to be a mosque that is a representative of islamic ideology in a given area rented community halls and basements can be used as centers for offering salat but they cannot carry the religious cultural identity of a mosque per se so i took upon myself the task of collating all information about the opening of the mosque and the role it played afterwards as a center of islamic activity in london and continued to do so for many years to come even during the years when the east london mosque was only but a series of plans and nothing tangible this included newspaper articles india office records which mentioned um, the indian muslim delegates of the round table conference held in london attending the fazil mosque and by bringing to light the facts that sir abdul qadir a non amdi muslim leader who inaugurated the mosque clearly stating that he was inaugurating a mosque similar approaches were taken when writing articles on the great debate that the promised messiah alayhi salatu wasalam had with abdullah atham i relied more on the articles that christian press was publishing and other non amdi press vernacular and english both to prove how the debate was taken at the time when it actually happened then tom holland came up with the idea that early islamic history was flawed so much so that there was even a possibility that the prophet of islam hazrat muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam may never even have existed in writing a response i took care and even mentioned it at the end of my article 
that almost no references was, or no reference was taken from Islamic historians, and that the whole of the bibliography comprised of works by non-Muslim historians and researchers. Same being the case with my article on the prophecy about Pandit Lekram, and the one addressing allegations on the academic credentials of Hazrat Mufti Muhammad Sadiq Razilatalan. There is still a lot to be addressed in the field of Ahmadiyya history. A lot is being said about Islam, and not only in the media, but in the highly esteemed circles of academic research. But why it seems to, but why it seems to be inadequately addressed is for a number of reasons. My understanding is that no work can be taken as serious academic work if it carries the element of bias, and if the opinion seems to be merely based on faith and not research. We have to understand that as the very term research journal suggests, our work has to be primarily based on research. This will then allow the author's opinion to be accommodated. When, on the other hand, if the whole work is opinion-based and research is only there to support your opinion, the journals will be justified in finding no place for it in their respective scopes. Now, how can religious belief be presented in a way that is acceptable to the academia? Well, there is more than one way. One technique used is to identify gap areas just as one would do before launching a new business. This requires a great deal of research in its own capacity, using resources like the Taylor and Francis website, who happen to be the largest academic publishers, we can acquaint ourselves with a number of journals who could be publishing articles on areas of our interest. The likes of the Review of Faith, the Review of Faith and International Affairs, Women's History in Review, Religion, Brain and Behavior, National Identities, and Contemporary Social Science are journals that publish articles related to our areas of interest. Another tool could be the JSTOR website where you, can research, where you can search for a title that you want to write about. An amazing resource as it is, it would open up for you a large number of articles from hundreds of thousands that they have in store, where you would be able to read an extract and then maybe read the whole article if you so choose. You would know how the topic you are aiming at attempting has been handled before by successful published established researchers. This would help you narrow down your gap area, hence increasing the chances of your article being picked up by one of the journals. Reading through all these articles will also help in establishing tactful ways of communicating an idea which is not being taken on board otherwise. For example, if you were to search for the term Khilafat in JSTOR, you will come across a greater number of articles as you would have expected. For example, an article titled Urdu Political Poetry During the Khilafat Movement from the journal Modern Asian Studies and another one titled Religion and Politics, the Ulama and Khilafat Movement uh, from the Economic and Political Weekly are only two from dozens that I have selected to refer to here. So this could be a potential area where one could help find a gap. And the gap is very obvious. Rarely is any mention made of the contribution of Hazrat Khalifa Sani Razi Allah towards the political and religious awakening of Muslims during this important phase of Indian Muslim polity. And how you communicate this fact in a fascinating way by bringing to light that a Khalifa was proposing solutions to the problem related to problems related to Khilafat is all up to you. Now let me read out a phrase to you. Dreaming, Islam, and the Ahmadiyya Muslims in the UK. This is a title of a research article published in a highly esteemed research journal, History and Anthropology. Sounds very intriguing, doesn't it? But the actual surprise is yet to come. The article is primarily about the Wakfeno scheme. By and it's written by uh, an academic back in 2010 who, uh, who was then based at the Roehampton University. 
Now, how is it related to the Vakfino scheme? By first explaining at length what importance dreams have in Islamic theology, and then going on to briefly describe that a Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya community launched a whole scheme by this name based purely on a dream that he had. She goes on to briefly mention the philosophy behind the scheme. When I came across this article first, I was extremely delighted. Not only that our Jamaat was mentioned in a very positive way, but also that Wakfino's scheme had been introduced to the outside world by an unbiased academic. But then I was struck by a concern. By only telling that parents dedicate their children even before birth for a religious cause, the article could potentially be laying the foundations of a tricky debate on human rights and freedom of choice issues. Nonetheless, one would have thought that research journals would never be interested in the concept of Wakfino. But as we can see, they actually were. Or I would rather rephrase this and say they were made to be interested in it. While this leaves us with the responsibility of clarifying the issue on a similar scale, it also makes it quite obvious that it's all about being tactful, and I use tactful here in the most positive sense of the term. While this leaves us with uh, the responsibility, like I said, it needs to be clarified. So jihad is one topic that sells like hotcakes. Only through this term, we can open avenues to talk about the Ahmadiyya version of not only jihad, but many other aspects of Ahmadiyya Muslim theology. We could be writing about reformist movements in Islam, and then bringing into the equation the Ahmadiyya viewpoint at a place where it is most suitable. At times, a single sentence can be more striking than a whole article. Even if the whole article does not mention Ahmadiyya, but only carries a footnote or citation to the works of the Promised Messiah, or to the world crisis and the pathway to peace, your contribution would still be of great worth and value. Then another important factor that could keep us from being successfully published in a research journal is not having the right type of credentials. I would again not take this as the academic publishers holding a bias against us. They are sought after and respectable for the fact that they have upheld their high standards. It wouldn't be fair to expect them to compromise their values only because we want to be published. So if we do not qualify, it is best to explore other options. Finding an academic who is an established author in the fields of religion, comparative study of religions, or reform movements in Islam, and discussing the option with them on the area which you have identified as a gap or a potential area that, that requires research. One such successful example is the book Islam and the West, Mission in the Age of the Empire, recently published this year in November um, 2017 by Bloomsbury. Um, I, I would um, recommend that we try and read it. I know it's very expensive at the moment. The hardback has only come out. The paperback isn't out yet. But it, it, I'm sure it's in most of the libraries already. Um, so it's all about the history of the Jamaat Ahmadiyya in Britain. So it's written by Professor Ron Jeeves, who is known to be an expert on Islam in Britain. Having watched his interview in a program aired by BBC on mosques in Britain, I thought that the story of the Fazl Mosque was not adequately addressed. It wasn't his fault because how a program gets edited is beyond the control of the interviewees. But it opened up an avenue for me to approach him and write to him and invite him to visit the Fazl Mosque. This was in 2012. The twinkle in his eye during his tour allowed me to take liberty and invite him to go through the records and archives of the Jamaat. This process of searching, reading, and then writing finally resulted in his book being published, like I said, by Bloomsbury in November this year. It took good, a good five years, but it is a work of its own kind, focusing solely on the efforts of the early Amdiya missionaries in England. The possibility of such a collaboration is not as difficult as it may seem. Challenges, there will be many, but I'm sure we're all ready to pay 
at least this much of a price for such a desired outcome. Now at the end, you may ask me the question whether my articles that I mentioned at the start managed to secure a place in research journals. My answer would be yes and no. Yes, because I take the Review of Religions to be a better journal than any of others that exist in the world because none of them was founded by the Promised Messiah salam. And no, because journals published by academic circles found my articles too amidified. But then, I was writing for the Review of Religions and the points I was writing about were such that, in, that my Ahmadi identity, or bias as the journals would call it, was destined to become obvious. But I continued to write because I knew that they would not go unnoticed. My article that I mentioned at the start of um, my presentation, titled London's First Mosque, A Study in History and Mystery, has been cited in one article that got published in a research journal, and two books published on the topic of Islam in Britain. Uh, and when I say cited, obviously it's um, you know, the article and it's been cited with reference to the Review of Religions. The articles about Agapramini on, uh, on the various sources of internet refer to my article on Reverend John Hughes Smythe Piggott. This, last but not least, is one other way of getting the message across to the circles that otherwise seem opaque. If your work is being referred to, references cited from it, or even being mentioned in the bibliography, then you have achieved your goal, which eventually adds to your own credentials as an author in a particular field. So as research in religious affairs becomes more and more challenging day by day, there still are many avenues that need to be explored to making our voices heard in circles that otherwise take us to be insignificant enough to be ignored. Allah the Almighty is promised to the promised Messiah that I shall cause thy message to reach the corners of the earth is being fulfilled and will always be fulfilled. This corner too will not be left out. Jazakum.